Good evening and welcome. I'm Barbara Krauthammer, Dean of the College of Humanities and Fine Arts and Professor of History at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. I'd like to begin this evening by acknowledging that our university community stands on Nonatuck land. And I'd also like to acknowledge our neighboring indigenous neighbors, nations, the Nipmuc and Wampanoag to the east, the Mohegan and Pequot to the south, the Mohican to the west, and the Abenaki to the north. Tonight, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Department of History's Distinguished Annual Lecture and the featured event in the Feinberg Family Distinguished Lecture Series. Tonight's presenter is the MacArthur Award-winning historian, writer, and activist, Dr. Mike Davis. The Department of History's Distinguished Annual Lecture celebrates the establishment of the UMass Five Colleges Graduate Program in History. Combining the faculty and resources of the University of Massachusetts Amherst with those of the four of the nation's leading liberal arts colleges, Amherst, Hampshire, Mount Holyoke, and Smith Colleges, this collaboration provides graduate students with an extraordinary depth of intellectual resources and research opportunities. Offered every academic year for over 20 years, the History Department's Distinguished Annual Lecture has been delivered by some of the nation's foremost historians. And tonight, of course, is certainly no exception. Tonight's lecture is proudly presented by the Department of History's biennial Feinberg Family Distinguished Lecture Series, which is made possible only because of the generosity of Kenneth R. Feinberg, a 1967 alumnus of UMass Amherst History Department, and his friends and family. Speaking on this campus during the 2012 series, Mr. Feinberg articulated his conviction that the study of history is instrumental in understanding and analyzing contemporary events. We in the history department could not agree more. Each iteration of this series focuses on a big issue, a topic that's of clear and compelling concern to our society. The series includes a wide array of events, including lectures, exhibitions, performances, panel discussions, and films, all of which invite audiences to consider historical context, analysis, and experiences to better understand the topic at hand. This year's Feinberg Family Distinguished Lecture Series is titled Planet on a Precipice, Histories and Futures of the Environmental Emergency. It seeks to deepen our understanding of the environmental er emergency through historical analysis, and in so doing, help us envision and construct paths forward. For more information about this series and to register for future events, and to see the list of more, our more than four dozen community and university co-sponsors, please take a look in the chat box. There, you will also find information about how you can turn on live closed captioning or listen to tonight's presentation in Spanish. Before we begin, I'd also like to invite everyone to join us after the event for a 25 minute discussion groups that are hosted by our faculty and graduate students in the history department and librarians from the UMass Amherst W.E.B. Du Bois Library. And so now I couldn't be more delighted to tell everyone tonight that Kenneth Feinberg is here with us. Mr. Feinberg completed his bachelor's degree in history and went on to a distinguished career in law and public service. He is undoubtedly one of the nation's leading experts in alternative dispute resolution, having served as the special master of the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund, the Department of Justice Victims of State Sponsored Terrorism Fund, the Department of the Treasury's TARP Executive Compensation Fund, and the Treasury Department's private multi-employer multi pension reform program. He was also the special settlement master of the Agent Orange Victim Compensation Program. In 2010, Mr. Feinberg was appointed by the Obama administration to oversee compensation of the, to the victims of the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. 
Most recently, he has served as administrator of the New York State Diocese, Diocese's Independent Reconciliation and Compensation Funds, the One Orlando Fund, the GM Ignition Switch Compensation Program, and One Fund Boston Compensation Program, arising out of the Boston Marathon bombings. He is currently the court appointed settlement master in the Fiat Chrysler diesel emissions class action litigation in San Francisco. He has been appointed mediator and arbitrator in thousands of complex disputes over the past 35 years. And I invite you all now to please join me <coughs> in welcoming our distinguished alumnus um, and my new acquaintance, Kenneth R. Feinberg. I want to thank you very, very much, Dean Krauthammer, for those uh, introductory words. I want to thank the chairman, the current chairman of the history department, Professor Brian Ogilvy, who also invited me to say a few words before we begin uh, tonight's distinguished lecture. Uh, with all due respect to the dean, uh, she failed in that list of um, assignments that I've undertaken. She failed to mention the, uh, perhaps the most important assignments that I've undertaken over the last 20 years, and that is I was invited by the UMass History Department on two occasions to appear as an adjunct professor in the History Department to teach courses in the History Department. And uh, to me, uh, those two years that I did teach were some of the most invigorating highlights uh, of my professional career. And I am in the debt once again of the university for inviting me to teach. I must say what I said at the beginning 15 years ago when we set up this lecture series. First, we learn from history. Those who do not learn from history learn a um, learn the sorrow and the anguish and the failure to take advantage of what history teaches us. Second, I will always be in the debt of the University of Massachusetts and especially the history department. When I came to UMass in 1963 from Brockton, Massachusetts and decided to major in history, I received a first class education, matured as a, as a scholar, benefited from professors that are still around, like Professor Milton Cantor, social and intellectual history, and Mario DePillis, who allowed me to participate in his one of his first very elite history honors courses. I continue to express my thanks to both of them and to the department. The least I can do is give back to the university in general and the history department in particular for all it gave me in my development as a student, as a lawyer, as a public, public servant in various assignments referenced by the dean. So this um, Feinberg lecture series is something that I um, wanted to do. I think it's a very important aspect of my career. I thank you all for participating. I'm honored to have this series in the name of the Feinbergs, and I will continue to do everything I can to advance the cause of the university and the history department. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Chairman Ogilvy, and I turn this back now uh, to our uh, special speakers. Good evening. I'm Jason Morley, Professor and Graduate Program Director for the History Department. On behalf of the History Department, I would like to thank Dean Krauthammer for convening the 2020 History Distinguished Annual Lecture. And, um, and on behalf of the Feinberg Series and its many partners and supporters, I would like to thank Mr. Feinberg for making this series possible. My task this evening is to introduce the moderator for this event. Vijay Prashad is a historian, activist, and public intellectual. 
He is the author or editor of dozens of books, including The Karma of Brown Folk, and most recently, Washington Bullets. Vijay is executive director of Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, and now he will introduce this year's distinguished annual lecturer, Mike Davis. Thanks, Jason. I'm grateful to Jason, to Jess Johnson, and the tech team for holding it down. Um, if you think being in a Zoom meeting is tough, and if you think being in Zoom meetings through the day is alienating, imagine being the tech specialist behind the scenes. So I'm very grateful to them for uh, struggling us through what I hope will be, I know will be a very fruitful hour in about 10 minutes. Um, I'm very grateful to be asked to moderate this event. In fact, I'm deeply honored because Mike Davis is a personal hero, um, an incredible writer. It's quite fitting, Mike, that you are the Emeritus Professor of Creative Writing at the University of California, um, Riverside. Uh, your work is so profoundly beautiful to read. The first Mike Davis book that I read was Prisoners of the American Dream which to my mind is one of the finest books that explains the political and social impact on the working class in the United States due to the hollowing out of the economy by the wealthy. As powerful was his city of quartz, a warning of the dystopia, the dystopias actually, if you think about it, that are produced by turbocharged capitalism that turns its back on the rhythms of human life and of nature. In quick succession came magical urbanism, then one of my great favorites, uh, late Victorian Holocaust. The titles, I should say, get bleaker and bleaker, Mike. Dead Cities, The Monster at Our Door, Planet of Slums, and then, of course, most recently, The Monster Enters, a book which reprises The Monster at Our Door, takes us from you know, the early SARS to COVID-19. Mike Davis has won the MacArthur Genius Award, the Lannan Literary Award, and much more. I want to introduce Mike as well with the epitaph from a book I really enjoyed reading called Buddha's Wagon, A Brief History of the Car Bomb. The epitaph for this book comes from Chechnya. And what the epitaph <laughs> says is, how can you sleep with death just around the corner? How can you sleep with death just around the corner? It's a question for our times. How can you sleep with death just around the corner? So glad to have your writings, Mike, to console my insomnia. Mike Davis, welcome to the Feinberg series. Thank you so much, BJ. And thanks to the history department and Mr. Feinberg for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, I'm speaking from California, of course, which so far this year, 4 million acres of forest has burnt in really what is the fire year from hell. And we're only halfway through it. We're not yet in the midst of the season, of the part of the season where the Santa Ana winds blow like dry hurricanes. So we're hardly out of this. It's been an almost unimaginable uh, ordeal. I apologize in advance for the awkwardness of trying to read something on, on Zoom. Uh, but that is as it is, I suppose. In a 1947 novel by the left-wing sci-fi writer Ward Moore, a mad woman scientist in LA, one Josephine Francis, recruits a down and out salesman named Albert Weimer, described as having, quote, all the instincts of a roach to help promote her discovery, a compound called the metamorphosizer that enhances the growth of grasses and allows them to thrive on barren and rocky terrains. She dreams of permanently ending world hunger through a massive expansion of the range of wheat and other grains. Weimer, a scientific 
ignoramus thinks only of making a quick buck, peddling the stuff door to door is a long treatment. Desperately needing cash to consider her research, Frances reluctantly agrees, and Weimer heads out to the yellowed lawns of tired bungalow neighborhoods. To surprise, the treatment, which alters grass genes, works only too well. In the art of the Dinkman family, crabgrass is converted into a nightmare devil grass, resistant to mowing and weed killers that begins to spread across the city. Quote, it writhed and twisted in nightmarish unease, inexorably enveloping everything in its path. A crack in the roadway disappeared under it. A shrub was swallowed up, swallowed up. A patch of wall vanished. It continues to eat pavements and houses and finally consumes the city itself, a monstrous new nature creeping toward Bethlehem. Greener than you think, It's both hilarious and slightly unnerving, but in the strangest of turns, its absurd premises are being turned into reality by climate change. Devil grass is actually bromus, a tribe of invasive and almost ineradicable weeds bearing appropriately unsavory names such as rip gut brome, cheat grass, and false brome. Its sinister allies from other tribes include the scourges of Medusa head, tall fescue, and barbed goat grass. In a first wave of plant invasion, black mustard and oat grass arrived from Europe in the Spanish period, and thanks to overgrazing by wild cattle, soon replaced native perennial grasses. The brums originating in the Eastern Mediterranean and the Middle East came as the second wave in the 1880s. They were described as a contagion that ate away at the endless carpet of wildflowers, whose spring displays in the foothills and valleys had stunned early visitors and put golden in the state's nickname. But now, increased fire frequency and exurban sprawl have become Brome's new metamorphosizers as they rapidly conquer and degrade ecosystems throughout the state. The Eastern Mojave Desert is a tragic example. En route from LA to Vegas and about 20 minutes from the state line, there's an exit from I-15 to a two-lane blacktop called Sema Road. It's the unassuming portal to one of North America's most magical forests countless miles of old growth Joshua trees, mantling a field of small Pleistocene volcanoes known as Sema Dome. The monarchs of the forest are 45 feet high and centuries old. In mid-August, an estimated 1.3 million of these astonishing giant yuccas perished in the lightning ignited dome fire. This is not the first time that the Eastern Mojave burned. A mega fire in 2005 scorched a million acres of desert, but it spared the dome, the very heart of the ecosystem. Over the last generation, episodic invasions of red brum have created a flammable understory to the Joshua's and transformed the Mojave into a fire ecology. Most desert plants, unlike California oaks and chaparral, are not fire adapted so the recovery may be impossible. Deborah Hewson, the chief scientist at the Mojave National Preserve, indeed described the fire as an extinction event. The Joshua, she says, are very flammable. They'll die and they won't come back. Our burning deserts are regional expressions of a global trend. The fire-driven transformation and replacement of native land cover from Greenland to Hawaii, excuse me. <coughs> Even the Antarctic Peninsula now has an invasive weed problem. In most cases, exotic plants, especially annual grasses and forbs are the culprits. In the east southeastern US, the devil is 
Kangen grass from Southeast Asia and Australia buffalo grass from India and Hawaii guinea grass from Africa and in Spain eponymous moratorian grass. But brooms superbly adapted to the Anthropocene rule the West Coast. As Travis being a weed scientist at UC Riverside warned last year, we have all of the nasty non-native Roma species here in California, and the ubiquitous weeds are the key drivers of increasing fire frequency. <coughs> Increased fire frequency in turn opens new spaces for the propagation of these fast-growing and easily dispersed species. When recovering mountain chaparral, for instance, requires 20 years before it matures enough to burn, brooms need only a two, one or two winters rain to reduce enough flammable uh, biomass to sustain large fire. And once established, the ensuing invasive grass fire cycle is almost irreversible. This is happening in all the Mediterranean biomes, despite the fact that vegetation it similarly co-evolved with fire and requires episodic burns to reproduce. The current wave of annual extreme fire in the Iberian Peninsula, Greece, Australia, and California is overriding Holocene adaptations and pushing native ecosystems, many of them already degraded, past their survival tipping points. Southern California's coastal sage scrub, for instance, is estimated to have lost 68% of its area to brooms and other invading weeds. Although Australia is a close contender, it is California which best illustrates the vicious circle where extreme heat leads to frequent extreme fires that prevent natural regeneration and with the help of tree diseases, accelerate the conversion of iconic landscapes <clears throat> into parched grasslands and treeless mountain slopes. And with the loss of native plants goes much of the native fauna from salamanders to owls. Now climate change drives landscape conversion in several different ways. From an earth systems perspective, the warming of the equator is expanding the Hadley cell the vast system of overturning circulation that pumps hot, moist air upwards, producing tropical rainfall, then the same air masses descend in the semi-tropics is high pressure ridges blocking rainfall and creating most of the world's deserts and arid lands. According to cutting edge, cutting edge climate modeling from Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, the impact on lower latitude temperate landscapes such as California will be profound. Quote, the ongoing climate change and future change, if it follows model projections, will transform and move Mediterranean type re climate regions. At the core latitudes of the regions, aridity will increase as winters become drier and temperatures increase throughout the year. On the equatorward flank, some locations that are currently Mediterranean type climates are likely to transition into subtropical desert or subtropical steppe. Good. This is likely the future of Southern California. On the other hand, Mediterranean climate will probably move forward into Oregon and even Washington, threatening many forests. Anthony Westerling at UC Mer Merced believes that this transition is now fully in progress and that explains the recent epidemic of extreme fire north of San Francisco. Climate change, he says, is giving Northern California a climate like Southern California in terms of the degree of drying that fuels undergo. Indeed, state water planners and fire, fire authorities since the turn of the century have been intensely focused on the threat of multi-year droughts caused by intensified La Nina episodes and persistently, stubbornly persistent high pressure dumps, both of which can be attributed to anthropogenic warning, warming. 
They've also anticipated that the drying of forests would increase vulnerability to insect infestations and tree diseases. Their worst fears were realized in the great drought of the last decade, the biggest since the 16th century, which contributed to the death of more than 100 million bark beetle infested trees, which subsequently provided fuel mass for the firestorms of 2017 and 2018. At the same time, an exponentially spreading fungal pandemic called sudden oak growth, which is also facilitated by drought, has killed hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of live oaks and tan oaks in the coast ranges from Big Sur to southwestern Oregon. Since the tan oaks especially grow in mixed forests with Douglas firs, redwoods, ponderosa pines, their dead hulk should probably be accounted as million barrel fuel oil equivalents in the current firestorms raging in the coastal mountain Sierra foothills. The 28 fires still ongoing. In addition to ordinary dry droughts, however, scientists now talk about a new phenomenon in California, a hot drought. Even in years with average 20th century rainfall, extreme summer heat, our new normal, is beginning to produce massive water deficits through evaporation and reservoirs, streams, and rivers. In the case of Southern California's lifeline, the Lower Colorado River, a staggering 20% decrease in the current flow has been predicted within a few decades, independent of whether or not watershed precipitation declines. But the most devastating impact of Death Valley-like temperatures was 121 degrees within LA city limits out in the San Fernando Valley recently, is the loss of plant and soil moisture. So wet winter and early spring may mesmerize us with extravagant displays of wildflowers, but they also produce bunker crops of grasses and herb-like plants that are then baked in our furnace summers to become fire starters when the devil winds return. The brooms and other pyromaniacal weeds like black mustard, pompous grass, and French broom are the chief byproducts and facilitators of this new fire regime. Years of research at experimental plots where scientists burn different types of vegetation and study their fire behavior has confirmed their Darwinian edge. They burn at twice the temperature for baseous ground cover volatilizing soil nutrients essential to the regeneration of native species. Whereas the historical fire season with the state's major savanna and chaparral species, plants like oak, chemise, manzanita sage, and buckwheat is six months long. The invasive bronze can burn almost any time during the year. A study published last year by the National Academy of Sciences estimated that the invasive grasses are already increasing fire occurrence by up to 230% and fire frequency by up to 150%. They also have a formidable capacity to alter soil conditions in their favor. According to UC Riverside researchers, invaders, quote, accelerate the onset of summer drought and decrease deep soil water recharge. It hit inhibiting the reestablishment of native shrubs and further increasing vulnerability to invasion. In addition, they sponsor the growth of microbial communities inimical to endemic plants, especially those that constitute Southern California's coastal sage shrub ecosystem. As a result, weeds replace often permanently the woody native shrubs that provide net carbon storage. This ecosystem conversion, warned scientists back in 2006, has changed portions of the Western US from a carbon sink to a carbon source, making previous estimates of a Western carbon sink almost certainly spurious. Now annual firestorms kindled by weed growth are overwhelming the state's highly advertised efforts at curbing greenhouse emissions. 
in the seven weeks from the beginning of August of this year to mid-September, megafires in California had released significantly more carbon dioxide, 91 million metric tons, than produced by all the cars, cities, and industries in the states the previous year. One fire alone, a 200,000 acre fire in Northern California, produced the equivalent of the annual emissions of 2.7 million cars. And weeds as weeds do can pop up literally everywhere. It was once believed in mountain chaparral, and I apologize to New Englanders if some of these landscaping botanical uh, terms seem strange, but uh, that's how we talk in Southern California. It was once believed that mountain chaparral was invulnerable to the broom threat, but today the wild grasses have taken over one third of the surface area. Chaparral is adapted to intense burns within a range of 20 to 50 years, but high fire frequency, one to 15 years, ensures the dominance of invasive species and a type conversion to grasslands. Likewise, closed canopy western for West Coast forests have never seemed threatened because they're too cool and shaded. But a research group at Oregon State's College of Forestry that is studying the question now warns forest managers that the species called false brome actually adapts well to forest gloom, while cheatgrass immediately colonizes forest burn sites. Once a durable feedback loop with fires established, a forest grass invasion becomes, in their words, a perfect storm. And like Weimer's devil grass, the invaders repel almost all attempts at extermination. Management actions, write the Oregonians, such as thinning and prescribed fire, often designed to alleviate threats to wildfire, may also add exacerbate grass invasion and increase fine fuels with potential landscape consequences that are largely under-recognized. UCLA's John Keeley, a world-renowned expert on fire and California's ecosystems, made the same point a couple years earlier. Quote, complete clearance can actually enhance fire spread by both increasing alien weeds that comprise flashy fuels and by eliminating important ember catchers, such as oak trees that can dampen the fire threat around homes. In any event, clearance by itself affords little or no protection. Last year, Keeley and his colleague, Alexander Sippert, published the first major survey of homes destroyed by the fires of uh, the last decade. And they arrived at the surprising finding, quote, that of the structures that did have more than 30 meters of defensible space, the vast majority were destroyed in the fires. In other words, the, tech book, the textbook prescriptions for reducing fire hazards may only reproduce them in a new form, something that is poorly understand, understood, if at all, by public officials. This is the true Achilles heel of the emergency legislation that Diane Feinstein, with the support of Governor Newsom, is trying to push through Congress. It would override <laughs> environmental regulations to accelerate the thinning of forests and the clearance of chaparral and brush. The bulldozers and torches would invite rooms into clear landscape, into cleared landscapes without factoring in their ability to annually generate large fuel loads. Only a sustained annual effort to reseed native plants and remove to the extent possible the brums and their friends, something that would require a large army of full-time forest workers and the cooperation of landowners could theoretically postpone the weed apocalypse. And let me note, I just, uh, received a book this morning that I ordered on California invasive plants. And when it comes to red brown, which is the grass that ignited the Eastern Mojave, uh, the recommendation is at all costs, don't burn. 
that will just accelerate its growth. But what are all the, the alternatives, according to this handbook used by uh, ecologists and, and fire workers, fire prevention workers? Uh, hand picking may do it. Uh, can you imagine plucking out weeds from hundreds of thousands of California grasslands and uh, uh, the hillsides? Dealing with the threat would also require a moratorium on new construction as well as post-fire rebuilding in the most extreme fire hazard areas. But this is hardly palatable in Sacramento, even in the era of the Democratic supermajority in the legislature. Governor Newsom and other liberal leaders address every fire emergency as the result of climate change and call for urgent action to reduce emissions. In doing so, they deliberately allied the question of what needs to be done on the ground, here and now. Such an agenda would have to directly confront the continuing dictatorship of land extensive real estate development, especially the sprawl along what fire experts call the Wildland Urban Interface, the WUI. The Forest Service definition of this distinguishes between two conditions. Interface is when suburban housing is near wildland vegetation, as in the Coffee Park subdivision of Santa Rosa, destroyed by the 2017 Tubbs fire. Intermixed, on the other hand, describes the intermingling of housing with brush and trees, the case with many homes in the dune town of Paradise, incinerated in the 2018 Camp fire. A majority of new housing over the last 20 years in California has been built profitably but insanely in such fire ecologies. And by one estimate, over a quarter of the state's population, 11 million people now live in the WUI. Moreover, the juggernaut, despite the firestorm, seems almost unstoppable. According to the 2018 report, by Bloomberg Business Week, quote, an estimated 1 million new homes in California will, will be built in California's high risk wildfire zones by 2050. In San Diego County, where I live, supervisors recently approved 10,000 new homes in what's officially called extreme fire hazard locations. This exponential increase in the fire hazard because of exurbanization, can be illustrated by a recent Northern California example, the Tubbs fire that destroyed part of Santa Rosa. Quote, in 1964, the Hanley fire in Sonoma County destroyed fewer than 100 homes. Last fall, speaking about 2017, the Tubbs fire, which covered almost the same ground, destroyed more than 5,000 homes and killed 22 people. Now, since 40% of the state's 33 million acres of forest are privately owned, 57% is federal land. Uh, so when Trump comes to California and blames the state for poor forest management, well, most of that forest is, uh, is federal land. And uh, the last I heard, he was still head of the federal government. So it's on his, his dime this has occurred. Only about 3% is actually controlled by the state or, or local governments um, as parks and so on. So there are few restraints on, on future development within the 40% privately owned uh, land without forceful legislative action. But attempts over the years to do this, even in the most modest ways, imposing a $150 fee on exurban homes to uh, pay for fire, local fire services, uh, or attempts to introduce some form of fire zoning, uh, have been vetoed by previous governors, Schwarzenegger and then Jerry Brown. And Newton himself recently vetoed a bill that would have required local governments 
to restrict burning permits in, quote, very high fire risk areas, quote, to only those homes that met the new fire and prevention standards detailed in the, in the bill. Now, the uncontrolled expansion of the residential frontier into disaster-prone landscapes, of course, isn't just a California trend. Think about the building boom on the Atlantic and Gulf Coast barrier islands, episodically submerged in hurricane storm surges. According to geographers Laura Taylor and Patrick Hurley, quote, despite the common perception that the U.S. has become a suburban nation, exurbia, exurbia, has emerged as the dominant settlement pattern across the country. Characterized by different patterns of development and different lifestyle expectations from cities, towns, and suburbs. With houses and scenic natural areas on relatively large, large acreages, often with one house uh, per 10, 20, 40 acres or more. So instead of densifying housing in the footprints of older suburbs, especially near rapid transit, which is the rational approach to the national housing, for, housing affordability crisis, market forces are poaching the wildlands and increasing car dependency while shifting the costs of wildfire protection onto county, state, and federal governments. But there are two very different migration streams, uh, talking about California. Some, like the inhabitants of Paradise, the Sierra foothills, city consumed by a firestorm in 2018, are rent refugees from the state's housing crisis, or ordinary folks, especially retirees, who want to own a tiny piece of the state's beauty. Many live in trailers or manufactured homes, blending in with the traditional low-income rural populations in the shadow of declining extractive industries. But there are minor players compared with the influx of wealth from the coast. Rural areas were once ruggedly blue-collared and derided as Appalachia, the insult long attached to eastern San Diego County where I grew up, now boasts, quote, starter castles, high-end subdivisions and spa retreats, from Mendocino on the north coast to the Sierra foothills in the east and the San Diego mountains in the south. Upper 5% migration has been gentrifying the urban hinterlands, especially those areas with high amenity values such as ocean views, wineries, forest lakes, or colorful local histories. Increasing numbers are second and weekend or weekend homes, affordable by those who have a solid, solid anchor in soaring coastal home equity. An equally prized of unspoken amenity is the racial homogeneity. Exurbanization is often a euphemism for white flight from metropolitan diversity. California's high income exurbs, regardless of their politics, are almost entirely monochromatic. Nevada County, one of the fastest growing Sierra suburb, exurbs, is just 0.4% black, while more liberal Mendocino County is 0.7%. As California suburbs turn to technicolor and become more democratic, the population in the wildland urban interface, especially inland from the coast, trends hardcore conservative and fiercely anti-government, except in fire season. One of their leading voices was Duncan Hunter Jr. And before that, his father, Duncan, also Duncan Hunter. Duncan Hunter Jr. is on his way from Congress to prison. He is represented, the Hunters have represented the exurban corridor along I-15 from San Diego to Temecula. For years, the hunters fought endangered species legislation and restrictions on backcountry development with the same zeal they opposed Latino immigrants and affirmative action. Uh, the hunters were the first to uh, advocate denying citizen rights, uh, birth citizen rights uh, to babies whose parents were undocumented. 
Now, this is a mindset blind to the consequences that allies itself to the botanical counter-revolution. Relentless land clearance and home construction, fragment habitats, introduce myriad new ignition sources, and promote weed invasion. Yet the newcomers in the majority are unwilling to accept state enforcement of building material codes or proposed fire zoning regulations. And they raise hell when foresters attempt prescribed burns. A recent report from the National Bureau of Economic Research targeted the perversity of using general tax funds to provide higher protection to the wealthy exurbanites who take so little responsibility for their own safety. Quote, the very fact that firefighting is publicly funded decreases, decreases the incentive for WI residents to fireproof their property, distorting the housing market further and creating moral hazard. I continue, because much of the firefighting budget comes out of federal disaster relief funds, publicly funded fire response decreases the incentive for a city or state, hello, California, to create and enforce wildland building codes. Meanwhile, undermanned fire crews are under tremendous pr pressure to defend individual home sites, making it almost impossible to adhere to the Forest Service doctrine of, quote, disengaging suppression activities immediately if strategies and tactics cannot be implemented safely. And the result, as I'm constantly reminded by uh, my ex-brother-in-law, with whom I remain good friends, he's a retired uh, county fire captain and in San Diego County uh, several times. Firefighters have perished trying to defend um, homes that are just out in the middle of the uh, the brush or the chaparral or on uh, mountaintops. And uh, he and all of his uh, comrades on the county fire force uh, are obviously very upset about this and see nothing but continuing casualty lists in the future. After fire, moreover, most ex exurbanites seem incapable of drawing the obvious lessons. In 2003, a firestorm, the Cedar Fire, destroyed over a thousand homes in the unincorporated towns of Alpine and Crest in the mountains east of San Diego, near where I grew up. When I took a documentary film crew working on a wildfire film last year to this area, the lost homes had been replaced by even larger houses and residents assured us that thanks to brush clearance, the fire hazard had been mitigated. Despite their own exper experiences, they had bought into the idea of defensible space and the illusion that evacuation would no longer be necessary. Three years ago, I wrote an article uh, about fires. This is uh, the time uh, of, of the Santa Rosa fire. And I pointed to the example of a little community called Carvacre in eastern San Diego County. Big homes built the end of a uh, one lane road surrounded by uh, chaparral. And I wrote that uh, even driving up that road in dry, hot summer, fire season conditions uh, sent chills up my back. And not surprisingly, three years later, Carvake was just burnt in a fire called the Valley Fire. Now, the stay and defend approach, uh, which developers uh, advocate and homeowners seem to accept, has effectively privatized disaster prevention and management by shifting fire safety responsibility to homeowners and private contractors, making it popular amongst developers and insurance companies seeking to defend property. But if we've seen from Keeley and Sippard's research, firestorms that create their own tornadic weather systems and can hurl fiery debris a mile ahead of the flame front 
are not deterred by 300 foot circumference of brush clearance or some carefully watered beds of ice plant. Nor can so-called fireproof homes resist combustion when extreme heat blows out the windows and ignites their garage doors. So finally, how should we understand the large scale ecological consequences, of the invasive grass wildfire cycle? One perhaps surprising analog is the aftermath of the firebombing of Germany during the Second World War. In the late 1940s, the ruins of Berlin became a laboratory where naturalists studied plant secession and the rubble. Their expectation was that the original vegetation of the region, oak woodlands and their shrubs, would soon gradually reestablish themselves. To the surprise, that was not the case. Instead, escaped exotics, some of them rare garden ornamentals, established themselves at the dominance with a new Rodero ecosystem. As one startled but fascinating researcher emphasized, quote, the unexpected spread of foreign species made possible by the destruction of broad areas of Berlin was such a radical event that it rendered previous work on the floor of the city completely insufficient. The botanists who until 1961, including naturalists from uh, the Eastern zone, they continued their studies until the last major rubble site, the Dornberg Drake, which had become the most, quote, most intensively studied ecosystem within a city that had ever existed, was cleared despite loud protests for hotel construction in 1986. The repopulation of rubble, wrote another naturalist, Created in many cities due to the activity of bombers in the last World War, has unintentionally become, and this is underlined, tremendous national experiment, which with respect to its size must be compared to the populating of new habitats created by volcanic activity. The persistence of this dead zone vegetation for a generation after the war, and the failure of the plants of the Pomeranian woodlands to reestablish themselves, prompted a debate about something called nature too. The emergent consensus was that the extreme heat of incendiaries and the pulverization of brick structures had created a new soil type that invited colonization by rugged plants that had evolved in the moraines of Pleistocene ice sheets, if not at the edges of lava flows. The final velociraptor in the Berlin rubble was the evil smelling Chinese tree of heaven, Atlantis, one of the most aggressive and ineradicable tree weed species on earth, superbly adapted to every sort of human landscape disturbance from thousand pound bombs to freeways. And today in California, you can find tree heaven almost everywhere, sprouting from cracked asphalt in LA parking lots, colonizing foothill stream beds, and so on. Now imagine, an all-out nuclear war, of course, would reproduce Berlin year zero conditions and replacement ecology on a vast scale. According to a 1960 government study, quote, under certain conditions, ultimate spread of fires from one nuclear weapon has been estimated to be as great as 10,000 square miles. And to model such firestorms, Army and forest researchers in the early 1960s studied recent fires in the Santa Monica Mountains as analogs for nuclear fire. They're particularly interested in the energy intensity of wildfires in various environments establishing a precedent for calculating fire energy in terms of tonnage of TNT. Now in the aftermath of Victoria's Black, Victoria, Australia's, in the aftermath of Victoria's Black Sunday fires in early 2009, that killed 173 people, Australian scientists calculated that the released energy equaled the explosion of 1,500 Hiroshima-sized bombs. 
Even greater energy has produced the pyrocumulus plumes that for weeks have towered over Northern California and Southern Oregon. In fact, the toxic orange smog that has shrouded the Bay Area might be considered a miniature nuclear winter. Megafires in the Anthropocene, in other words, can easily be seen as the physical equivalence of nuclear war without fallout. As a result, a new profoundly sinister second nature is rapidly emerging from our fire rubble at the expense of landscapes we once considered a con a sacred. Weeds and weedy species of all kinds will continue to win victories within the new evolutionary spaces opened by climate change. Our imaginations can barely encompass the speed or scale of the catastrophe. Gone, California, gone. Thank you. Um, Mike Davis, gone California, gone. What an ending. Um, I think a lot of people are wondering, is California gone? Are people going to pack their cars and do a reverse dust bowl, drive back to the American South or to the Midwest from whence their ancestors came or perhaps get on a plane and fly to Asia or somewhere else? buying oceanfront property in southern, in southern Arizona. I mean, is California finished? I'm not thinking going to the Midwest. My two kids are still in high school. Our experts in relation to Canada, uh, Canada may emerge as a superpower thanks to uh, global warming. The point I'm trying, that I've tried to make in this talk in many articles and talks I've given recently about fire, is simply this. Climate change is bringing about major irreversible transformations in vegetation and, and fauna. And while we can certainly do things to mitigate fire conditions, it's impossible for us uh, to change that fact. And that's a worldwide fact. Whether it's peatlands in eastern uh, Siberia, whether it's the Fertile Crescent, which scientist Lamont Doherty uh, will tell you isn't the Fertile Crescent anymore because of climate change, a fact that has contributed to an exodus of rural people in the Middle East, uh, become a major factor in the wars of the, uh, of the region whether it's in the Caribbean, which will suffer massive drying, as well as Central America, where drought refugees from Honduras are already camped out 12 miles away from where I speak uh, in shanty towns in Tijuana, trying to desperately uh, cross the border of the US. All this is the reality that uh, our world system and motor production have, have brought upon us. And uh, of course, there are things we can do, but we have to accept the kind of damage that is now built in and absolutely unavoidable. You know, it, it reminds me of Mahmoud Mamdani's book on Darfur, where he argued that a point that has been neglected in the uproar around the attacks in Darfur is the desiccation of the Sahara. I mean, the Sahel region and the, the increase, the creeping southward of the Sahara. You know, I've seen that personally in, in Niger and in Chad, and you just see, uh, you know, agriculture becoming impossible. A lot of your talk and a lot of, you know, what is happening in the Sahel region of Africa reminds me of Crosby, Al Al Alfred Crosby's book, Ecological Imperialism, the sense that these are just things we're going to have to learn to deal with, that there is a, we've, we've crossed a barrier. Um, you know, th th there's a lot of people asking questions, you know, what should we do? Should we have well-timed grazing um, to manage invasive br bromes and things like that? 
um, I mean, you use the word just now saying you can mitigate things, but you can't reverse the tide. I want you to say that again, uh, you know, in, in a way that is clear to people. Well, the big question, of course, is who, who has the power or resource to mitigate? And obviously, the poorest quarter of humanity doesn't have those resources. That's the part of humanity that lives in countries that have contributed only minuscule amounts of greenhouse gases that stand in the way of the most catastrophic effects, particularly in agriculture. The Indus Valley is the largest irrigation system in the world, supporting 70 to 90 million people. I forget how, how many. And it's in great danger from the early melting of glaciers and snowpacks uh, and from desiccation. And it's hard to find a region in the world except for Canada, which will see a great northern expansion of agriculture and uh, trees will move, uh, move north. Uh, that isn't in the crosshairs. The problem is that the countries and the rich classes in those countries that are responsible for opposing and preventing effective action on climate change, they have no rational actor uh, incentive to aid the poor. So built into all of this is a kind of incipient genocide. And we see it all around us. Like I said, 12 miles from me is the fence, the, you know, the border fence, to repel people who have no choice but to leave their traditional homes in the search of food, water, and uh, some form of employment. And the Iron Curtain has been replaced by Great Wall of Capitalism everywhere. I mean, look at Australia, Fortress Australia, the concentration camps that's built on the Puan Islands, uh, and so on. That's why I believe that in all things, we have to act in name of the unity of the human race and in the name of what's necessary, not what's realistic or seems possible uh, at the present. And this is a consciousness, I believe, that deeply permeates the generation that my younger children uh, belong to and their friends all around, uh, all around the world. Meanwhile, older generations in the United States and Europe and elsewhere uh, live by the principle of consuming all the good things of, earth, of the earth in their lifetime and leaving nothing uh, behind. I think that we're set on a terminal course right now. Uh, People who believe that, well, Biden will be elected and democratic capitalism will get its act together and we'll go back to a new period of growth and, and, and happiness. I mean, this is a foolish, foolish illusion uh, at best at a time when uh, low wage workers in this country, uh, I mean, they went to bed in <clears throat> March of this year it's 2001, they woke up the next morning and looked out the window, it was 1933, and that's unlikely to change. You know, uh, Mike, I mean, Walter Benjamin had a beautiful line where he said the, the socialist imagination isn't to make the train of society go faster, but to pull hard at the handbrake. Um, you know, that insight seems more and more prescient um, as you said, getting growth started might not might be exactly part of the problem. Um, you know, part of the solution might lie in changing everything. I mean, I happen to know your daughter. She's a very sensitive person, a book editor, a reader, somebody who likes ideas. You know, uh, I mean, it's, it's 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 this is this is the kind of of generation that's coming up, sensitive people who are not interested necessarily in being vacuum cleaners of the planet's resources. Um, think a little bit with me about this idea of socialism as pulling up the handbrake rather than accelerating the train. Well, I, I think first of all, uh, we need to be more precise about what socialism is. 
Socialism is the democratization of economic power and investments. The, the power that's now invested in say the 500 largest corporations uh, in the world that control our fate in so many, many uh, different ways. And I was a little bit critical of the Occupy movement because the stress was almost entirely on in income inequality rather than the question of economic power of, for instance, nationalizing the banks, of which there was a real opportunity in 2008. You didn't even need to be a socialist to believe in this. Ireland temporarily nationalized uh, their banks. There have been many opportunities to expand, to expand public ownership and to democratize uh, public institutions uh, that weren't taken. But the big question that you're asking uh, is kind of haunted uh, the environmental left for a long time. How can we guarantee to every person on this planet a high quality of existence, given that the footprint of industrial capitalism or state socialism, it seeds the care of the planet. I think that's how some people would describe it. And I wrote something once called Who Will Build the Art? And it's a solution lies in the socialization of consumption and in the city, real cities, not suburbanized cities like American cities. I mean, Think of your campus. I haven't been to UMass Am Amherst, but my impression is probably a very pretty park like a uh, 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 campus. I don't know if that's true or not. But on a typical campus, students, including married graduate students, live very modestly in a shared room or an apartment, a small house. But look at the social infrastructure for recreation, knowledge, and human interaction uh, around them. Magnificent swimming pools, athletic facilities, great uh, 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 libraries. And what to the utopian socialist Charles Fourier was most important, uh, high degrees of promiscuity. Fourier defined promiscuity as the intimacy of strangers. Uh, you know, so easy to be in love on a campus and so much harder to be isolated than it is for uh, single poor people, aging people in, in most American cities. By embracing this kind of model, which was the, the subject of an intense debate and, and experimental practice from uh, William Morris in the 1880s, down through the, the Russian constructivists and Red Vienna in the 1920s, trying to create an alternative urbanism built upon this socialized consumption and public affluence. I mean, even in the grim conditions of the 1920s in the Soviet Union, when people were crammed in often two families in a single apartment, and the means for uh, transforming uh, residential life were very slim. The constructivists built these workers' palaces, you know, cinemas, sports facilities, libraries, and so on, next to every large factory. And they were magnificent. They were the kind of noted arms of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, a socialist regime. So I believe that ultimately there's no real contradiction against everyone on this planet's rights to a meaningful social role in employment and to the things that are necessary in life, which I assume includes, you know, running shoes and, uh, <laughs> and jeans and maybe your cell phone and stuff. There's no reason we can't guarantee this. The environmentalists have been wrong about this all along. And of course, there's a hardcore of them who embrace a simply Malthusian version that uh, those people who are in the lifeboats stay in it and we can't take anybody else uh, aboard. That is an almost neo-fascist uh, mentality. It's also not true because 
you know, we know the UN Food and Agriculture Organization has told us there's enough food on the planet, and yet 3 billion people, almost 3 billion people are hungry. They're hungry because they don't have money, not because there's not enough food. And I'm very sensitive to what you said, Mike, about rethinking ways in which we live and our personal ambitions for how we want to live. Because I think this is what people around the planet, many by dint of of you know compulsion have to think about because more and more people are losing their jobs permanently in the pandemic and their their way of life their quality of life is deteriorating um, it's going to be you know very easy to convince people uh, to rethink what life should be when your life is deteriorating so rapidly it seems to me this is a perfect time to talk again about these broad questions about how we should organize things. I mean, what you talked about, about the real estate market in California, for instance, uh, and the way in which people want to defend, you know, uh, their houses at the edge of where it's impossible to live. Um, that is not only, of course, the problem. The problem is much graver than that, which is that the ambitions that capitalism has provided people outstrip our capacity to live as, you know, a species on the planet Earth? Well, I mean, I mean, look, capitalism can no longer cheat, create meaningful social occupations for people with income sufficient to a decent standard of living. We know that the majority of the urban workforces of South America and Africa and in some parts of, of South Asia are informal workers, which is a kind of euphemism for structural unemployment, getting by the best they can. That number is increasing uh, dramatically. And even in the so-called new industrial countries, the NICs of uh, 10 or 15 years ago, uh, because they turned mainly to commodity exports to China, uh, their industries have shrunk. Sao Paulo, instead of the booming industrial center it once was, uh, shows signs of becoming a Rust Belt. So the system no longer needs us to exploit us. And it, in a sense, makes a large part minority of humanity kind of surplus the requirements of accumulation on a global scale. Capitalism is incapable, or private medicine and big pharma is incapable of translating revolution advances in biological design into public health. Capitalism in the current model of agriculture, <coughs> pardon me, cannot bring about the 50% increase in grain production that the AFO has argued for years is necessary to feed the population in, in uh, mid-century. Uh, one of the great unanswered, unasked questions in the debates, of course, is nuclear disarmament, which is almost totally marginalized and forgotten. Yet it seems almost inevitable that we'll see at least a regional nuclear exchange within the next generation. Uh, and not sooner. We could, we could increase <clears throat> the list, but at each crucial point, human survival is directly put in, <clears throat> put in question by the concentration of economic power and by the use of nationalism uh, to ma manipulate uh, the masses. So I think you're absolutely right. And I think my uh, youngest daughter and her brother are still in high school, absolutely right. They only want to talk about radical change. They don't have time for anything else. They won't buy into any incremental pattern. So we need to return to the train of the kind of radical imagination of creating a new civilization, which was done in parts, experimental, but it was done. And for 50 years, uh, anarchists, socialists, and others dreamt that dream and tried to make it real. So I think anything short of a utopian imagination is a kind of treason to the future right now. 
I mean, honestly, I'm with the high school students and with anybody who wants to dream, you know, a mad dream, because a mad dream is a lot better than what looks like a sane reality. Um, you know, we have a few minutes to go. There's good questions coming on the YouTube site, on, on the Zoom chat and so on. But, uh, Mike, I, I, I just, it's impossible to have Mike Davis here giving a talk in the midst of a pandemic. Um, when I read The Monster Next Door, I was terrified. And I recently finished reading The Monster Enters with the beginning on COVID-19. It's terrifying. I got to say, Mike, there's a way in which you make the world really terrifying. But then I keep saying, it's not Mike Davis. The world is terrifying. And Mike Davis is mirroring it. But there's something you said here in the beginning. I just want you to talk a little bit about it. You referred to a doctor, Dr. Peter Hotez from Baylor University, National School of Tropical Medicine, who after the MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome outbreak, developed a vaccine. And he recently went before a, a house panel on science in the United States and complained that he has had this vaccine sitting in a freezer. And he says there's a problem with the ecosystem in vaccine development and we've got to fix it. He claims that he has had a vaccine. If it had gone into trials, might have been something, but no cooperation and the state, neither was there a corporate or government sponsor interested in testing and manufacturing it. I mean, we live in a nut system, Mike, a nut system where scientists are providing us with things but money just doesn't want to bite. Well, I mean, there's uh, quite a few absolutely essential inventions uh, locked away in warehouses and closets and refrigerators. For example, the Obama administration uh, was worried about the problem of personal protective gear. And so what they did is they invested, they found a company willing to take the risk and they invested in creating a new technology in producing the N95 mass, okay? And they built the, uh, an assembly line for this. It sits there today. The, the company development went to Capitol Hill in January, warning them and begging them uh, about the need to nationalize uh, the production of essential gear and to use technology uh, <clears throat> that was already there. And it, of course, nobody paid any uh, attention to it. I mean, look at the way in which uh, pharmaceuticals are developed. The first step is usually in a public university where the essential breakthroughs happen. Then that knowledge is that research is licensed sometimes to scientists themselves. You get biotech startups <coughs> doing genetic uh, uh, design, uh, monoclonal antibiotics, that kind of stuff. And when they get to status were reducing in mass, then that's bought by big pharma. Big pharma doesn't do anything in terms of viruses and bac bacteria. We're in desperate trouble on this planet because the, the antibiotic revolution of the 40s and 50s is now collapsing in the face of antibiotic resistant drugs. <clears throat> and the failure of big pharma to uh, produce new antibiotics and antivirals, they're not popular. Uh, profitable enough, of course. Uh, it's far more profitable to develop things to deal with sexual dysfunction amongst old codgers like me, not as lifeline uh, antivirals. <coughs> so to every point, uh, the development of what we need so urgently is blocked by patents, blocked by private profit. And we don't, we seem to have forgotten that key things like the uh, influenza vaccine when shown as salt helped develop. Well, before we did the polio vaccine, it was produced by the US Army, it's produced by the government. Well, if most of the knowledge is produced in our public universities, why should this be used to seed 
to, to the profit margins of great pharmaceutical corporations. <coughs> Pardon me, I have a, I have a, we need, <clears throat> we need to raise such questions systematically whenever they're appropriate, which is a lot, but not most, most of the time. Big Pharma is a fetter on developing protection against, <clears throat> against disease. <coughs> Sorry, VJ. No, 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 please, please, please. You know, I, I, as you were talking about Big Pharma and, well, I mean, I agree with you that the question of intellectual property rights is, is a fetter as well. I mean, it's this, you know, the vaccine for COVID-19, we should be talking about a people's vaccine instead the vaccine is becoming not only, uh, you know, an agent of private property, but also of national ambitions. Our country must get so many, well, you can't have any and so on. Meanwhile, Vietnam, a poor country, suffered terrible bombing from the United States government, including with Agent Orange. Ken Feinberg was part of um, the recompense for the Agent Orange. Um, Vietnam, in the early part of the pandemic, Mike, sent 550,000 pieces of protective equipment to the United States because they have a public sector that can produce things which the private sector in the richest country in the world just couldn't produce. There are currently, right now, more COVID-19 cases in the White House than there, than there are in Vietnam. I mean, okay. these socialist countries have shown us that something is possible. Vietnam is quite extraordinary because it also <coughs> was successful earlier in the 2000s in containing avian flu. Part of the reason is the two Pasteur institutes in Hanoi and Saigon, which are absolute world class and an army of local health workers. Now, we have, uh, <coughs> we destroyed the budget for public health. 60,000 public health jobs, county public health workers, you know, visiting nurses and so on, and lost their jobs in 2008 and weren't for hired. This country's been making war, even under democratic administrations. Um, on public health and essential medicine. We've let hospital chains eliminate a million and a half uh, hospital beds in the last generation, allowed them to run on just-in-time inventory, which is good for their balance sheets, but means we lack a national surge capacity to deal with things like the current uh, pandemic. We can go on and on. Vietnam and China Taiwan and South Korea, we we're talking about capitalist countries, socialist countries, whatever you want to call how you, you regard China. But they all have solid grassroots organization. Ordinary people intervene in their own behalf. They train, they know what to do, or they have somebody on the block or in the building who does. And so they can be mobilized. Well, we sit here you know, locked in our homes or unconsciously going out and, you know, partying with no sense of responsibility or uh, any kind of designated social function to deal with emergencies of any kind. I, this is an issue I've raised for, <coughs> for years in terms of earthquake safety. You're in California, the, uh, the rule is pour toilet paper and water and wait to be dug out of the rubble. Japanese don't do that. Okay. I have strong neighborhood organizations to respond to earthquakes. I know where the nurses are, there's the neighborhood construction workers, pipe fitters, all the people who are, <clears throat> are useful. <coughs> I'm very sorry to all of you. I think I'm about to lose my voice. Don't worry, Mike. We're going to end in about a minute. Um, I wanted to add to your list, of course, the Cuban doctors of the Henry Reeve Brigade, who I hope very much will win the Nobel Peace Prize for their work, uh, you know, in trying to quell not only this virus, but the other one you've written about Ebola and so on. Um, Do you know where the Cubans, you know, the, the, they uh, went to 18 countries to uh, <clears throat> provide medical relief 
after the start of the pandemic. And one of the countries they went to is Andorra, a country that's mainly known to stamp collectors, I think. Pyramids, <laughs> this tiny little country, <coughs> had a terrible uh, coronavirus spread. And they asked their masters, the French and Spanish governments, to help them out. They wouldn't. The Cubans went to Andorra. They'll go anywhere where people need them. The Cubans are the best. Mike Davis, uh, this has been an incredible uh, hour and 20 minutes, half an hour. You end, um, the monster enters with a line I want to read as a way to close out our event. Um, you say, now with a real monster at our door, and I'm not just thinking about COVID-19, I'm thinking about the California forest fires, I'm thinking about the pandemic of hunger and poverty and so on. Now with a real monster at our door, as terrible as in any science fiction, will we wake up in time? Uh, thanks a lot for a really thoughtful and very valuable presentation. The way things are going to work is that people are going to go to a brief 25 minute discussion group immediately following um, this event. Uh, this discussion groups will be facilitated by graduate students, faculty from the UMass History Department, librarians from the W, the very well named W.E.B. Du Bois Library. Um, these will take place in separate Zoom rooms. You'll find it in the Zoom chat. Uh, you'll find it in uh, the YouTube chat and so on. Mike, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Uh, good luck with that cough. Don't forget to wash your hands and wear a mask when you go out. Don't listen to the president. He doesn't know what he's talking about when it comes to COVID-19. Thanks a lot and good evening. Thank you so much, Vijay, and to all the people attending the lecture. Struggle.